everyone. Uh, welcome to this um, colloquium of the Simon Center for the Social Brain. It's a great pleasure to introduce um, Michael Long. I've been following his work for um, a few years, but only met him in person just uh, last week or a week and a half ago in New York. Um, so uh, Michael got his undergraduate degree at uh, Rhodes College in Tennessee, and then he went to Brown to do his graduate training. And then um, starting in, uh, I guess, 2003 or so, he was uh, at MIT working in Michael Fee's group um, with the Songbird model um, and has done some really amazing stuff. And then uh, from 2010 onwards, uh, he's been faculty at uh, NYU Medical School where he's now a professor. Um, he broadly studies um, skilled movements, often in the context of uh, vocalizations, uh, vocal interactions. Um, and he takes a comparative approach, uh, working with more models than uh, most people you would know. He works with birds, uh, but also uh, mice, but also humans. Um, Michael's work is both theoretically really important in various ways, but also methodologically rigorous and cool. Um, I think he was the first to use uh, local um, cooling of the brain of the uh, cortex. He first did this in mice, uh, sorry, in birds, <laughs> but then Amazingly, he also did this in humans, and it worked, and he showed a really cool dissociation between two stages of um, speech planning. Um, what else did I want to say? Oh, um, OK, well, I, uh, I don't want to take up too, too much uh, more time. A lot of you probably have heard, um, if you haven't heard of Michael before, uh, you probably heard of Michael's work in 2019 when he published a paper on singing mice, um, which made a big splash in the popular media. And um, the thing that I find kind of really inspiring and um, exciting about Michael's work is that he brings his rigor and precision from the kind of approaches that are typically used in circuit models, in, uh, in, in, in circuit level um, analysis of animal models, all the way to the complexity of humans and studying really messy, complex behavior like real time um, conversations, uh, as um, I think he'll talk a little bit about today. Okay, let's welcome Michael. Thank you. Um. It is absolutely a pleasure to be here. Uh, I spent six years and three months here, uh, but who's counting? And uh, it's in Michael Fee's lab, who's a fantastic person. I see a few few lab people out here. Um, I was going to say, you know, that scene in, in uh, was it, Gross Point Blank, where the guy hides a joint and then comes back for his 10th reunion and finds the joint. That didn't happen here. Um, not there anymore? Not there. <laughs> no. So uh, I, I want to talk today about interactive communication, and I'll be talking mainly about humans, and then there's a kind of coda about the singing mice. Uh, so I, I reserve all the bird data into one mega slide. Um, and uh, I want to start with this uh, movie that I think uh, is really motivating. It's motivating to me. And uh, this is a person who had a stroke on the left side, and uh, my father-in-law had a similar uh, stroke on the left side. And these are movies that are taken by a neurologist at NYU, where he just interviews this person. And you can see a clear deficit, not only in gross motor skills, so it's, he has trouble moving the right side of his body, but also uh, in terms of uh, his speech. What happened? Yeah. You're not sure? Yeah. Uh, did you have a stroke? Yeah. OK. And what symptoms did you have? What's wrong with you now? Okay, so you can't move the right side of your body. Are you able to speak okay? Well, yeah. Okay. Do you feel that your speaking is normal? No. What did you used to do for a living? Uh, yeah. Can you talk about it? You're pointing to the computer. I guess you work with yeah. computers, is that right? Yeah. Just talk about it a little bit if you can. No. You can't? Yeah. Um, does it bother you? Having trouble speaking? Yeah. So speech is an amazingly complex act, and it's something that many of us can do uh, quite effortless effortlessly. Um, but it really is uh, quite an intricate behavior. And so uh, this involves about 100 different muscles moving in a very precise way. And words themselves can have uh, acoustic structure on a 20 millisecond time scale. So it's something that, that is actually tough to achieve. And of course, we don't speak into the void. Uh, we speak uh, with others often. 
And, uh, and that can be even tougher, right? Not only are we marshalling all of these muscles to try and make some words that could make sense, um, but we're doing so weaving this kind of word stream in and out of a very dynamic conversation. So what this is is two minutes of an annotated podcast where uh, these two people are talking. You can see the times that they're talking represented by these white and gray shapes. And uh, as mentioned, conversation. We just did a really cool conversation meeting in New York last week. And, uh, and one thing that, that was brought up again and again is this kind of idea of turn taking. Right? So uh, this very rapid back and forth that, that can be done uh, when two people are engaged uh, in conversation. And this has been studied. Uh, it's been studied actually uh, in a lot of different contexts, but including uh, this corpus of conversation that was carried out without any visual cues, so effectively uh, over the phone. Um, and the time between speakers, this kind of floor transfer offset time, is enormously fast. Right? So about 200 milliseconds on average. And so just to take you through this plot here, uh, the negative numbers are times when one person is actually speaking over the other person. And these are really long pauses. And if you want to just think about how painful a pause can be, <laughs> that, that was about a second, right? And so we're very good at this very rapid fire uh, conversational exchange. And so how does this work? Um, <clears throat> we started thinking about building a model for this, and uh, Frank Gunther, who I actually met out here on the softball fields many years ago, his team would come in from BU and just beat the pants off of the MIT team, and, uh, and I started working with him, and he's, he's really great, and so we constructed a model of interactive speech, and of course, what do we need? We need to hear our partner. This is something that many people, including in this room, might, might study, uh, sensory processing in the brain. Um, and then there's a motor response. These things, I think, can be looked at very easily in other organisms as well. Right? But of course, with speech and with interactions and with many things, um, there's also a, a distinct cognitive component. I will say that much is known about sensory and motor by a bunch of people, including uh, Ev's excellent work and many other people that have contributed to this um, in the field of, of speech production. So we developed uh, a framework to start thinking about this, and we're trying to go by the old idea that uh, you know all models are wrong, some are useful, right? But uh, we think what what actually has to go on in this person's mind when they're responding to a conversational partner, and so we think of this as three distinct pathways. And this whole idea was really based on um, behavior. So this is uh, the work of Greg Castellucci, who's a really gifted linguist who's in the lab. So looking at the behavioral literature, linguistics literature, um, as well as uh, neuropsychological studies, so cases in which um, insults to the brain, things like strokes can cause selective aphasias that can affect specific modules here. So in addition to content, we have to deliver that content with precise timing. We've talked about this turn taking back and forth. And then there's, of course, an emotional valence to this as well. And uh, a paper came out in uh, annual review of neuroscience, and we kind of put uh, a fine point on these details if you want to learn more. But what I'm going to talk about today is uh, this middle pathway, this content pathway, specifically planning. And, uh, and then we're going to try and use this pathway to say, let's use this as an entry point or a framework for starting to think about other animals and how we can incorporate our findings from other animals as opposed to just saying, a bird sings, therefore it's language, right? Language is something that's pretty special but it's not about human exceptionalism, which is something Merganka and I talked about earlier today. Um, inst instead, how can we approach this and how can we use a model in a sensible way to try and address, um, for example, circuit principles that could be underlying some of these behaviors and some of these uh, algorithms. Okay, so I first wanna talk about uh, this. So this is primarily part of a paper that came out earlier this year. I'm gonna go over some of the data in that paper and then I'm gonna tell you more about a follow-up work which has to do with stimulation and perturbation of specific processes and trying to understand the kind of behavioral effects of those uh, stimulation uh, perturbations. Yeah, so the idea here is what neural mechanisms underline the planning processes required for interactive vocal communication. Okay, so um, the technique that we use is electric corticography. And so uh, this are, these are two of our, our subjects here, some, two of our participants. Um, you can see this is where the ECOG arrays are. Um, and they give us pretty good spatial and temporal resolution on the order of about 10 millimeters and 10 
milliseconds. And I should tell you that in the eight patients that we uh, analyzed as part of this uh, study, about half of them were uh, undergoing uh, treatment for medically intractable epilepsy and the other half were for brain tumors. Um, what's amazing is that both in an extended acute context where uh, people are implanted for a few weeks to see where the seizure locus is, um, or even in a case where someone is awake during a neurosurgical procedure acutely, they can still converse for the most part. And so this is a kind of uh, an example of that. So we've just lined up um, all of the turns from this experimenter that's interacting with a participant. We've aligned the offset of those speech turns and we see the participant can respond uh, with very fast latency, often uh, a fraction of a second. Okay, so uh, we needed some way of isolating planning. It's a tough thing, right? So if I want you, uh, if I want to see the brain processes that are involved in sensory responses, I can make noises. If I want to see things that are involved in speech, I can just have you talk, right? So how do we actually engage planning? And so we use a task that was uh, first introduced by Sarah Bogles and, uh, in the Levinson lab. I think it's a super clever task and it, it did really well for us. And so the idea is this, we can ask a participant uh, a number of these questions, there are three different question banks. And an example here uh, are body part questions. How many fingers does a healthy person have? How many toes does the average human have? How many arms does a human being have? And as soon as I hear that critical word, right, these, these senses are all relatively the same, but there'll be a single body part there. And that body part is something that they can then start planning their response when they hear that critical word, okay? And there's other kinds of questions. The opposite of soft is what uh, frequent word, uh, et cetera, and even, uh, sorry, animal uh, noises. Right. What does the fox say? Okay. And uh, so this is uh, what we found, and I just wanted to show you some of the data as it's kind of unfolding, and then we can analyze it uh, together. And... Uh, Right, so what I'm gonna show you are the average responses in this time period that's indicated by the, the gray bar. And the gray bar um, is meant to show a 200 millisecond time window before the onset of the question, okay? And this is an array that's uh, mo mainly in frontal uh, cortex, although you can see it's extending into sensory areas here as well. Um, and then there's a strip here in auditory regions of cortex. Okay, and the actual response is, is shown here with these symbols, and as the response gets bigger and redder in z-score space, uh, there's a larger response at that electrode. Okay, so the partner starts to speak, and I'm now follow that gray dash here, this gray window, it's 200 millisecond response as the partner starts to speak, and you can see in auditory cortex, things start to light up. That certainly makes sense. Uh, for us here, we're looking at high gamma activity from 70 to 150 hertz. Okay. Then, um, immediately when that critical word is introduced, and these are average responses across all of the trials, right? We've can align to that critical word and ask what happens here, and you can see that there's some activity here in this frontal region. That then, when the response is prepared and then uh, given, we see that migrate into uh, the sensory motor cortex, okay? And then immediately when the, the answer is over, things return back to a baseline. So I think this really highlights the speed of this specific measuring uh, modality. And you can see, again, if I take you through this movie, this is a baseline. We start with a question. Here is uh, a part after the critical information is introduced. This is immediately before the response, during the response, none. Okay, so we wanted to then use a GLM here to characterize each of the electrode's responses. And we can do that um, in the following way. So uh, there are two example questions given. The opposite of soft is what familiar word, and the opposite of what familiar word is soft. So these are really the same question, but we've just taken that critical word and moved it around, okay? So if we think about what would a perception response look like, what would a sensory response look like? We'd see something that should be active during the question, during this kind of acoustic stimulus. Right? And indeed, that's exactly what we see in some cases. So this is a single trial response 
um, in, in, in Z-score, uh, the Z-score um, of high gamma activity. And you can see it's high during this question. And actually, there's a little bump here um, because of just re-entering voice of that, that person. OK, uh, planning, if we think that this critical information is actually engaging planning, then we should see something that turns on with this critical word. And you can see here, this is the trick that we've used. If that shows up early or late, we still see activity that's tied to that critical word. And then finally, um, this electrode, we'd say, would give a motor response on this single trial, where there's a big bump that happens when the person responds, in this case, with the answer two, two eyebrows. Okay. So now, if we take those three electrodes and we look uh, across trials, so these are uh, cases where uh, the specific electrode had 79 trials as part of that uh, stimulus bank. And uh, we can align to the beginning and end of the experimenter's question. You can see this perception electrode has activity throughout the question. OK. Um, and if we align to the beginning and the end of the question here, that doesn't really describe well the planning or uh, the production. In fact, there seems to be a dip in uh, the production electrode. OK, um, now we can organize the data slightly differently. And we can actually align activity based on that critical word, which we think will be important for initiating uh, planning. And if we do that here, we now lose any kind of structure in what we're seeing in the perception electrode. But this planning electrode indeed seems to have activity that's tied to that critical word and seems to be ongoing until it's time for that person to answer. Um, and then, of course, this production electrode is on during the second set of ticks, and that's simply when the patient is or the, the participant is responding. OK. And we see uh, that many electrodes fall into these categories um, of perception, planning, or production. They seem to be somewhat um, selective for those three behaviors. OK, so now that we've characterized each one of these electrodes, we can place them back onto the brain. We have over 800 electrodes that we've characterized across these eight participants, um, all on the left hemisphere. And it's a little hard to see, but there are these tiny little white dots. That's the location of all of the electrodes. And if we look at significant responses, we'd expect to see um, auditory responses here, uh, primarily in the temporal lobe, but maybe uh, some islands like here that have been described by others. Uh, we'd expect to see motor responses um, in sensory and motor cortex. And in terms of planning, it could be anywhere. Right? The different places have been uh, proposed by, by other groups. Um, and at least in our very specific paradigm, we uh, indeed see these uh, responses that are largely tied to the areas that we expected. But planning seems to be primarily in this hot spot here. Um, largely around the inferofrontal gyrus. We could look at it in a different way, and this is just looking at the percentage of uh, active electrodes. And you can see there's a kind of yellow beacon that's here that has uh, caudal inferofrontal gyrus, this part of middle frontal gyrus, and then here even uh, kind of edges into uh, the motor strip here as well, so the, the ventral sensory motor cortex. So we wanted to characterize these signals a little bit. And so we took a page out of Ev's playbook and, and some others and were able to try and do some control uh, types of uh, commands to ask, how linguistic is this response? And so uh, one idea is that we'll see planning in this kind of hub that we uh, were studying here, um, that we'll see it with any behavior. It's generic. Right? And so one idea is we could take the spring-loaded button that the participant has, and we could have them plan to hit this button a certain number of times. And when we do, we don't really see this area engaged uh, during that behavior. So it doesn't appear to be generically premotor. Uh, we can have that person do an oral facial non-speech movement. So things like sticking out your tongue, puckering your lips, smiling for the camera. Um, and this, again, doesn't really engage uh, this area. We start to see more when we ask the person to repeat a word or a non-word. This is a case where we say, say the sound ba clearly into the microphone. And finally, when we have a more uh, 
linguistically rich task, uh, like pluralization that requires lexical access. Say the portal of goose clearly into the microphone, uh, this, this lights up. So this, um, as we, we look at these tasks of increasing linguistic relevance, the planning network we identified as preferentially active during those linguistic tasks. Okay, so uh, that's fantastic. We don't usually sit around saying what sound does a fox make or whatever. And so what does this mean in terms of unstructured vocal interaction? And of course, you know, as neuroscientists, there's always a tension between, you know, some kind of ethologically relevant task or setting uh, versus uh, something that gives us some uh, ability to analyze our data very clearly, some more uh, stripped down uh, laboratory-based task. So we tried to understand what was going on during natural conversation, and we're starting to see that there could be similar kind of planning dynamics there as well. And so the idea here is we can characterize using the, the kind of tasks that I've told you about already, this critical information task. And then when we're done with that, we can just chat with the person. Did you, did you go to the cafeteria today? Did you try that sandwich? This salad bar was a little scary, whatever, you know? And, uh, and we could see there's turn taking here in this, in this case. Um, and I'm gonna show you just the, the activity of two electrodes during this time. And so there's one electrode here in speech motor cortex and another one um, in inferior frontal gyrus. And uh, so we're asking, were, uh, were you born in Mexico, New Mexico? Have you been to Mexico? No, never, never. Okay, so motor is motor. The red electrode here, you can see there's plenty of activity that happens when that participant responds to the experimenter. But what I think is really exciting is these bumps that happen here during the question. Right? So you can actually see in real time the planning of that person, or at least the activity in this area, as they're, as they're engaged in this natural conversation. Okay, another way of looking at the data, and I don't want to put too fine of a point on this, but uh, we could also do a PCA and just say, look, how similar are the signals that we're seeing in the brain here? Okay, and we could look at, uh, for example, these electrodes activities, and if we say, ah, well, each of these clusters represents uh, electrodes on which there are very similar signals. We're keeping agnostic, um, you know, the task or whatever is being done with these guys, although this was actually... Uh, carry, that analysis was carried out uh, during the task. And so um, if we then do a similar analysis during conversation, you'd expect one of two things to happen. We could see uh, similar clusters like this, or you can imagine conversation is a very different behavior, right? It's, it's interactive, people are more engaged in, in that kind of conversation. They're flush with neuromodulators, who knows? Um, maybe things are, are less so. So if we just do this unbiased task of just saying how similar is the activity on these electrodes, it seems like things cluster like this. And then if we take the designation from our GLM from this uh, task and move it over here and say, remind me again, how do we characterize these electrodes in our task? We find that the neurons that we carry, uh, the electrodes that we characterize as production before indeed do a similar thing. Um, and can be clustered in this way. So it suggests that electrodes display functional clusters across both contexts. There isn't anything particularly special about conversation. And we can use those uh, PC weights to construct what is effectively a weighted average, right? So uh, for a given uh, perception PC cluster, if you like, we can look both in critical information task and in conversation. And we see in this case, perception is happening uh, all the way up until the offset of the experimenter's speech. That makes some sense. And then planning, a bump happens here following that. Um, if we then, so the dynamics here are very similar. It's a little hard to see this kind of blue bump happening like that. That's a, an average across all of our patients that we've looked at. Um, and then finally, if we look at planning versus production and we align here to a participant onset, planning precedes that and, and production happens after. Okay, so similar dynamics. And so now we're trying to understand what these kind of potential planning dynamics are, are good for, and we're trying to do a perturbation. Uh, of course, there are plenty of natural perturbations. I've shown you a movie at the beginning of this talk that was a natural perturbation, someone who had a stroke on the left side. 
Um, this is a reanalysis from uh, Nina Dronkers of Broca's first aphasic patient uh, back in the 1860s. Right? You see that the, our planning area here matches roughly the kind of area of insult of that patient. Um, and we know that Broca's aphasia is a global language production deficit, but we don't know if this really is specific to speech planning. So we decided to use uh, direct cortical stimulation. And <clears throat> the idea here is, you know, we could take a page out of uh, Wilder Penfield's book and actually administer that stimulation right at the surface of the brain and see if we can perturb different parts of the brain and ask what kind of behavioral deficits uh, result. And so uh, we've known for a very long time, and this is kind of the idea of a motor homunculus grew out of this, right? That stimulation of primary motor and somatosensory cortex can result in dysarthria, so speech arrest and disfluency. And so this is an idea of a non-stem case. The word is the opposite of bad. Yeah. Okay, and this is the experimenter asking that question. This is the critical word, and, and they said the correct answer. But in this case, we're just simply the primary somatosensory uh, uh, motor uh, cortex is stemmed. This is more on the somatosensory side. Um, this is the time of that stimulation in yellow. Opposite of bad is which common word? <laughs> So you can see there, he really couldn't get the word out. And he later said that he felt like his tongue was frozen. Right? So it's a kind of was a t titanic uh, response. So in this same person, um, stim can be moved over. And now it's more in, in the area that we've characterized. Um, and we would have certain expectations of what we might find. So one thing that we probably won't find, because we don't think that this is really active during our articulation is we aren't going to see a lot of gross speech problems like dysarthria. Um, and uh, I think at least cognitively we'd expect to see things like uh, delayed planning, so increased reaction times, um, and uh, speech errors, especially things that involve lexical retrieval. So here's an example of uh, one of the, the STEM trials of this person. Of bad is which common word? Easy. The opposite. I mean, good. <laughs> right. So you can hear he said easy, just fine. There was no problem with him getting the words out, uh, but he had the wrong word. Whoops. The pot is what common word? Two. <laughs> right. So this is this is not correct, um, and in fact. Two was the correct answer for the previous question. So he had that word hanging around, and he played that word, and he wasn't able to grab a new word. Um, I'm sketching out here a few more examples that we found um, in, in stimming these uh, putative planning sites. So which word is the opposite of fast, rapid? This is, of course, the stem in yellow. The opposite, the opposite would be slow then. So there's a kind of self-correction that's happening here once the stim is over. Clearly into the microphone, say the plural of foot. Foot. What's the plural of foot? Feet. OK. So the idea, again, of correction once the, the stim is, is over. Uh, this is our one right hemisphere participant where we saw an effect. Um, we think that this person is actually left dominant, so um, I'm just going to submit this as what it is. Um, the opposite of hot is what common word? Cold. How many toes does a woman have? T ten? So there's a clear, uh, and, and this isn't a disfluency, this is just his inability to directly address this until he corrects himself. What animals who bark are often seen on farms? My brain just farted. <laughs> So we also expect changes in reaction time, uh, a somewhat uh, unfortunate color scheme. But uh, so these are the critical information questions again, the critical information in blue. Um, red here follows that. Um, this is the participant under normal circumstances. And in cases where stimulation is administered, you can see that uh, the reaction time 
is much longer often. This shifts off to the right uh, considerably. So the control reaction time is 146 milliseconds. That's very fast. Um, and stimulation is, is more than three seconds. OK, so we're still collecting data on this. Uh, we, these are all the areas that we've stimmed, so 28 anatomical sites from 16 participants. Uh, we really would love to get more data here, but we catch as catch can, right? The, the people who are volunteering for this are um, absolutely critical for this experiment. And, and we, we get people who want to volunteer, and we get whatever brain they have to offer. And so um, we, would, we would love to figure this out, but, but we'll be patient. We'll, we'll figure it out. Um, these areas showed uh, motor deficits. Um, they're on this kind of motor strip. That makes some sense. Um, when we look at simply reaction time, so I'm not reporting errors here, uh, but if, and again, uh, this is blue, it's slower reaction time, these blue stars. Um, and interestingly, we see places where um, they answer faster without any change in accuracy. So this is something that I think is really exciting, and we'd love to know more about what these areas might be doing as well. OK, so in this human part, um, speech perception planning and production activity are separately represented in human ne neocortex. Um, a language planning network uh, necessary for interactive speech includes middle frontal gyrus and Broca's region. The interactive planning network is primarily tuned to linguistic operations rather than generic motor planning. Uh, consistent cortical responses occur during scripted tasks and natural conversation. And finally, perturbation of activity in this language planning network leads to slowed interactions uh, and linguistic errors. OK, and in the second part of this talk, it's uh, um, about a third of the talk or so. I'm going to try and take a comparative approach. Uh, we're going to talk about the singing mice and how we could learn something about that. And so uh, I've mentioned this framework. And I think the framework gives us an opportunity to address the, the problem in that uh, you know, language is unique to humans. How can we actually get to things like circuit uh, algorithms, things that we care about as systems neuroscientists um, in a human. It's big and hard to, hard to wrap your arms around. And so um, I think that, uh, you know, our lab uh, has a lot of experience with, with this guy, um, some experience here, and we've just gotten a bunch of budgies and a fantastic postdoc to do the first recordings in those animals um, to start to understand how they do what they do, which is really tremendous, hundreds of human words. <clears throat> and so the idea here is because this is now uh, a framework that has many different boxes in it, we can, we can study box by box in different animals that are appropriate for that, that box. We can say language is big, but there are certain aspects that we can look at, and we can use these kinds of creatures in order to look at those aspects. And in doing that, we can drill down um, on those creatures and understand something about how the brain does uh, what it does. And so, um, you know, this is... Uh, as I, I guess I mentioned last week at, at the meeting, this is over, what, nine orders of magnitude of length scales. This is on nanometers, and, and conversation is really meters, right? And so um, trying to understand how, how circuits do what they do and, and get insight from all levels. So uh, one thing that we're very excited about, one aspect of interactive speech that, that is salient, that was in my third slide, is this kind of turn-taking back and forth. Um, and we know that you know, we're not unique in that. A lot of animals are capable of turn-taking, just not any animals that are really used in the laboratory. And so uh, we decided to study these guys. And so they're um, Costa Rican rodents. They live in the cloud forests of, of Costa Rica in the mountains. And, uh, we have a collaborator who goes out there for about a month every year, brings these animals back. We breed them in New York City. Uh, been working with a few theorists uh, and some fantastic experimentalists to understand more about what they're doing um, with this kind of interactive behavior. So this is a movie of two singing mice. They're in two different terrariums, um, actually in the same room. So this split screen really is a split screen. They're not in the same tank. Uh, one is going to start singing. 
Uh, the other one will listen. You can see him preparing, and then he responds with his own song. So one question is, what the hell is the song doing? Um, we're trying to figure that out. So we have a big terrarium now with thermal cameras. They can run, but they can't hide. And so we're really following these guys and understanding how they use their song. It's clearly a territorial song, and it's one in which they can understand the identity of other mice. Um, but you know, the, 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 the jury's still out on that one. OK, so the song looks like this, a sonogram. Uh, so frequency is shown here on the y-axis. Time marches are on like this. And, and typically, the song is between about 6 and 10 seconds long. And so it's uh, consisting of, of a series of these notes. And they expand uh, in time like this. So you can see this example note is quite a simple frequency downsweep. And things get more and more complex as the song goes on. Uh, this is just a dot showing the duration of each note in that specific song. And what's important, of course, and you saw this from the movie, is they do this interactively. And so this is a tale of two animals. This white animal has lived in the room for several months. This red animal comes in as a kind of young upstart and seems to have an answer for everything that white animal uh, is saying. And so this white animal starts, the, the, the red animal uh, finishes. Red could even start as long as it, it finishes that interaction. And so um, you can see over the span of over an hour here, things are quite correlated, almost look like spike trains from, from two different neurons. Uh, they do this really well. Uh, marmosets do this well, but not really well. And so uh, in the singing mouse, if we align, for example, uh, for a pair the, uh, to the offset of that resident animal's song, and we ask when the intruder animal makes his song, and I should say the females also sing. I think it's super intriguing. We'd love to have more hands to study the female song. I think it's a, a, a great direction. Uh, but here it's two males. Um, the, the male response is shown here with really high temporal precision. If we look at the normal kind of Levinson diagram of human speech interactions, um, that distribution looks like this. And the singing mouse distribution looks like that. So it's somewhat hard to see, but it is qualitatively matching, I would say. Uh, whereas this is about 200 milliseconds, this on average is about 500 milliseconds. And that's very different than what has been reported in the marmoset, which can be much longer. And in terms of marmoset vocalization, um, often this is driven by, uh, for example, cingulate cortex. So one can stimulate cingulate cortex the heart rate will increase, and then a few seconds later, uh, they'll create this kind of fee call, which can be done in an interactive, antiphonal manner. Um, is Cortex doing anything with this? Well, the answer seems to be yes. And so uh, the reason we say that is we can stimulate in a patterned way across this cortical surface. This is the average of, I think, uh, five or six animals. And this hot spot here represents a place where when we administer electrical stimulation, we see really strong flexion of vocal musculature. Right? So that stimulation um, at very low currents can make uh, the dicastricus muscle flex, um, as well as uh, some other muscles that, that were, were found in, in our collaborators' lab. So what's going on in the brain during this time? Uh, we've put silicon probes into this orofacial motor cortex, that hot spot. We see activity that uh, happens during the, the song. Some cells fire at high rates, some lower rates. And we can kind of plot this out here um, with this plot. So each row represents the activity of a cell during this uh, call. And if we look across these four trials, we can see these all look quite similar. The beginning of the call is in green. The end of the call is in red. And uh, the network seems to be doing something that looks uh, quite stereotyped during the performance of this behavior. And if we look outside of song, things look much more mixed up. Uh, we also see social modulation of single neuron activity. So uh, this is a nice example of that. So if we look at 
songs of different lengths here. So the beginning and actually the duration of the song is, is shown by this kind of shaded area here, spike trains. Um, we can plot this a different way. I think it's easier to see. Um, and that's on this color plot. So the beginning of the song is shown with a black tick. The end of the song, also a black tick. And of course, these kind of yellowy colors represent higher firing rates. And we saw quite a lot of heterogeneity uh, before the song. And if we sort that based on alone singing versus counter singing, uh, we see that that heterogeneity can be well explained by the partner song. So as the partner starts to sing, we see activity that emerges within these, uh, within these cells. OK, so uh, I'm, the hour is getting somewhat, uh, my phone is off. Uh, <laughs> but let me go uh, somewhat quickly over a manipulation that we're going to give here, and then I'll show a final experiment and wrap up. Um, so uh, this is, I included this for Murdad's benefit. I don't know if he's here or not, but uh, here's a manifold, because why not? And uh, the idea is, how can we actually perturb um, activity to try and find out how, you know, wh who's doing what in terms of uh, this vocal behavior. And so we thought of it like this, you know, uh, Ev mentioned cooling. And so one benefit, I think, of cooling is that if you have some kind of activity, these eight neurons, for example, that's pushing you along this path and to give you some kind of behavior, um, you know, we could do something like optogenetic perturbation uh, that can knock this thing off its axis and, and, and pull you out of this neural trajectory, but also really compromise behavior as well. So what we wanted to do is, is use something like cooling, and we can see if that can be a tool to help really keep behavior intact. So we can now look at the relative contributions of, for example, this cortical structure and a subcortical structure. So it goes down this manifold, but it simply does so more slowly. OK, so we had three ideas of what we might see. One idea is that the dynamics are exclusively in this kind of motor cortex structure. OK, this is effectively what we saw in the songbird. So if we cool down HVC, that song stretches out. So these are example uh, sonograms. And each one is about two degrees cooler than the one above it. And songs can sing in slow motion. So what would we expect to see in the the singing mouse in this case is that the song should change, the notes should change, everything should change if, um, if uh, things are in, uh, actually encoded in orofacial motor cortex. Another idea is, eh, it's a mouse. You know, what's going on with the mouse? Who cares? Uh, cortex, you know, the, this is a kind of very cheeky paper that was uh, made with this mouse line that really was born without a cortex. They sing just fine. Uh, you know, it's a... It's not a singing mouse, but it's ultrasonic vocalization, although I would say these two examples are quite different to me. Um, they've been quantified, and at least in the paper, the punchline is, without the cortex, they do their thing. And so it could well be that uh, the subcortical structures are really what's setting all of this, and cooling leads to no changes in either notes or song. Um, and the other idea, of course, is that those two things can be dissociable. So there could be an actual note generator that's sitting down there, some central pattern generator in, the, in the, the brainstem. And this is actually exerting some kind of executive control over that, speeding things up, slowing things down. And in fact, we see something like this. If we look at the songs, if you look at those, remember those trajectories that, that uh, could describe the song, just like the duration of those notes. When the animals are singing by themselves, not only do they sing uh, fewer songs, but those songs are really quite stereotyped. All of these trajectories are just laying right on top of each other. But when the animals are singing in a social context, right, they have the same set of notes, but they can kind of get there more quickly or more slowly. And we think that maybe this represents some kind of drive from these cortical areas that are playing upon that central pattern generator for making a note. So the idea there is it could well be that notes uh, are, are kind of a finite set. But how those notes are deployed is really something that is the business of this uh, more cortical structure. So when we cooled, that's exactly what we found. We found that the set of notes, uh, when we're manipulating uh, the orofacial motor cortex, remain the same. But the whole thing kind of stretches out in terms of how long it takes to get to the end of the song. 
So we think that in this case with these animals, the orofacial motor cortex actually has an enormous amount of control over the song itself. So we think of this as a note generator and this is some kind of executive control over that, changes the speed, stops and starts, and would be perfect for counter singing. Okay, so now we have something that could actually lock horns with another vocalizer and enable these kind of vocal interactions. So we did the final experiment here. Um, we could do playbacks from a loudspeaker um, of a conspecific song. And the playback times are shown with these kind of vertical lines like this. And the responses are given in this case with a, a dot, right, a red dot. And this guy responds pretty faithfully to a speaker because he's a mouse, you know. Um, and then if we turn off orofacial motor cortex, so we just put mucimol into that area of the brain and make it really leaky so it, it's much less responsive, we see uh, the number of responses, vocal responses, goes down to nearly zero. But thank God it wasn't zero, so we could actually look at the timing of those residual responses. And what we find um, is that they're quite slow. Right? So they look a lot like what we found, or not we found, but what uh, Asif's uh, lab found in the marmoset, in that they're taking between five and 10 seconds. And so we think that maybe a kind of cingulate pathway may still be um, at play here, and we could, in future experiments, for example, turn those uh, inputs off and understand something about their role in this late component. But what we clearly see is that OMC inactivation eliminates fast vocal exchanges in this creature. Okay, so in my final slide here, um, I want to point out a few, I think, intriguing parallels. Um, one is that there's a sensory trigger here, in this case, the critical information, and we'd love to know what the sensory triggers are in speech, uh, you know, for conversation, and that's something that people have, have studied quite extensively. Um, in the mouse, we don't know what that sensory trigger is. We know that if we play back, for example, just the first half of a partner song, they never respond. So there's something about getting to the end, but if we just play the end, they also don't respond. So um, something about that partner song is important. We'd love to know what that cue is, and we're looking into it. Um, there's motor preparation in this kind of uh, speech planning area um, and orofacial motor cortex, um, and a motor response here is fast, uh, fast uh, spoken exchanges and counter singing. And if we perturb these, so in this case, uh, focal stem dis disruption, and down here with pharmacological inactivation, we see slowed interactions and linguistic errors, and uh, we can abolish counter singing. And uh, thanks to everybody who helped with this, and thanks for your attention. Um, so we do put electrodes uh, onto the human brain, and uh, this is in the context of neurosurgery. Um, and the stimulation, it's a bipolar stimulator, and uh, the context is either, uh, well, up to this point, it's really been either tumor removal or epilepsy patients, and so part of the skull is removed, the stimulation is administered, the person is awake. Um, you know, it's not perfect, so they have to be on you know, they're typically a little bit woozy because of, of drugs that are obviously going to be in their system. But they're awake, and the statistics of their turn-taking can resemble, um, or in some case, perfectly match, really, uh, natural conversation. Um, yeah, so it is, it is literally uh, human touching the, the cortex, yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. So, like, arcuate fasciculus or something. I don't know. And when we do direct stem of temporal lobe, we see either nothing or they seem to get faster in two cases, which is remarkable. Um, 
So I, I, the answer is I don't know. I mean, they're trying to access the right, the right uh, answer, right? And they're going to take this and put this into some articulatory coordinate, and then they're going to hold this in some working memory cache, which we really don't query at all, right? We don't really talk about any kind of buffering, although that's one of the blocks in this diagram here, right? What, what we've basically told them to do is answer as quickly as they can. So one thing that we could do to basically look at that is, is have a queue that's three seconds later to ask something about working memory and what might be going on there. Um, in terms of sensory changes, uh, you know, I, I don't, often they'll respond that they, you know, that their, their brain farted, they couldn't think of it, you know, this, this kind of a thing. It, they don't really report that they hear buzzing or any kind of acoustic uh, disturbance. Right? I don't know if that gets to your submitting that paper in two days. Yes, yes, um, thank you, yes. So, so if we look at the activity in OMC, um, we see this kind of heterogeneous thing, right? So some cells would be onset cells, offset cells, some things that seem to track up with the ramp and down and, and different shapes. And we, we, you know, depending on how you lump or split, we see about nine different flavors of, of effectively sustained activity throughout the 10 second song, which is really amazing, you know. Um, we'd love to know if those 10 different flavors represent 10 different output patterns too. Are these all going to be cortical striatal? This is all in layer five, okay? Um, but if the animal is singing a shorter song or a longer song, the entire dynamics change in the OMC, right? So um, that I think is really exciting. We see this kind of cortical activity where about half of the cells are clearly tracking the song and we can see that the whole thing just expands out if it's going to be a longer or a shorter song, things get really compressed. And so um, I think what cooling does is effectively change that, right? We take whatever local dynamics are, that are there and we can artificially expand them and that also expands the song. Yeah, I'd love to know. So, so we found this area through stimulation, right? And, and that's, that's a very specific thing. Like, this is something that's clearly doing something motor. It's functionally tied to, these, uh, to the musculature, probably many, many synapses going between the two. Um, we're now working with microECOG, and so we have sensors all over the cortex during different phases of, of these interactions basically trying to find out how other cortical areas are involved. And we would love to know, and I think we're going to get to an answer to your question with that exact experiment. We have not done that yet. I think, you know, we, we love what happened with human ECOG and being able to look over large expanses of cortex there. We're going to do the, the same thing with the mouse because I feel like we're looking at it through a straw. Um, and in the human, we're now recording units to try and understand what's going on at single neurons as well during these kinds of tasks. But that's, you know, um, ongoing. Yes? I, I think, I mean, there's sign language was a very special and important case. There's also just gestures. I mean, my hand just did this. Well, I said there's also just gestures. Um, right, and I think all of that is super important and exciting. Um, in our case, uh, it, we are talking to the face of the patient. They're lying down and having neurosurgery, so their gestures are basically nil. And, uh, and for, for patients that are uh, doing sign language, we haven't had one yet, uh, and we've worked for, with tens of kind of neurosurgical patients. Um, one thing that I think is interesting, especially uh, to this crowd, is that there's a comorbidity, of course, with with uh, epilepsy and autism, and so it'd be very interesting to see how these kind of planning processes are different in cases of, of autism. Uh, have not looked at that, uh, but would love to look at that. Yes?
Yes. agree with that. Another thing, if we wanted to be a little easier on them, um, is at least for the anatomy questions, the answer is often a number, right? So we could kind of combine and say, give the answer with two, right? So how many shoulders does a human have? Ding, ding, right? So, so that, I think, could scratch that itch. And I would love to do that experiment. And it's, it's right there to, to do. Um, thank you. I, I really, it's a great idea. Andrew. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to say it was, it was that. It's not. So, I mean, um, depending on who's helping, I'm, I'm typically out there for these. I, we work with the University of Iowa to, to record a lot of the primary data here uh, for reasons I can tell you over a beer. And um, they're fantastic. Uh, but our, our stem, if, we have, if I'm not there and somebody else is helping out, they may tend towards longer stems or shorter stems. Uh, we can do a post hoc analysis to ask you know, how, how that plays into it. Um, Someone is, is literally, absolutely, right. Yep. Good, thank you guys. Oh, wait, one more question. Yeah. I was just wondering, so when you did the simulation and you were different types of there, were there some that were more common these were, these were probably the most uh, common, where they're asked to do some kind of conversion on a word like pluralization, and often they just hand back the word that we gave them. It became a repetition task. Right? So their ability to go and access a new word is something that is clearly compromised. Um, that's the most common error that we see, and we see it a lot. Thanks for the question. Thank you all for your attention. <laughs>